Hello and welcome. This is NTA Tuesday Live and I'm Cyril Stober. Nigeria is not in the best of times over the daily occurrence of conflicts, tension, perceived collapse of the political system, social decay, corruption and religious violence. Now the core reason attributable to this is the poor attitude to understanding and respect for the religious tenets and beliefs of each other. Now despite various government efforts to put an end to all the violence, there seems no end to it, with intolerance growing by the day, leading to disunity and disrespect for traditional and cultural practices and institutions of state. The various acts of violence or religious crises have had a bitter impact on interreligious harmony in a pluralistic state like Nigeria. Now, part of these have also been traced to inter-ethnic struggle, ignorance, the struggle for power and relevance, and to attain economic dominance. Now, since the major religions practiced in Nigeria preach peace, harmony, tolerance, patience, understanding, and good neighborliness, why then all these religious crises and violence against one another? Now, the federal government in the year 2000 set up an interreligious council arising from the level of misunderstandings occasioned by lack of trust among the different religious faiths and beliefs. Now, the success of the interreligious council requires not just government alone, but individuals and groups who can muster the courage to say no to divisive acts that breed violence and mistrust. But what brought about the sudden distrust in the society? And how much can be invested in the promotion of peace, unity, and understanding? Now, can Nigeria ever return to that glorious past when people were their brother's keepers, in the true sense of the phrase? Now, these are some of the questions we'll be raising tonight on NTA Tuesday Live with a distinguished panel. But let's first get to see this report by Talatu Izariki. Religion serves as an instrument of social harmony in many civilized societies. Nigeria, a secular state, has two main religions, Islam and Christianity, each claim 50% of its population. The overwhelming majority of the two faiths live together, work together, intermarry, and had mutual respect for each other. Scholars say interfaith unity, especially in the 60s and 70s, was highly cherished. This was evident in the harmonious living and sincere display of love. It is on record that in many parts of the country, a number of community development projects were jointly embarked upon by Christians and Muslims. In the northern part of the country in the past, there was peaceful coexistence. Uh, people went to the same schools, people ate the same food together, people celebrated with one another. We know that wherever there is discord and there is violence, there cannot be joy, there cannot be progress. There was absolute unity. I remember that time there was an uh, armed robbery along Koi Road. Both Christians and Muslims entered into the mosque and left their things inside the vehicle. And there was everybody, nobody knows that one is a Muslim or one is a Christian. We show each other love. stated in the Holy Quran that La Ikira Afiti, there is no compulsion in religion. So when you are doing your own, unity matters. A Muslim can assist a Christian, while a Christian can assist a Muslim. Dialogue, living together as one family, doing this together as under one umbrella of unity, is the only solution that can solve our problems in Nigeria. Analysts observe that over time there were challenges occasioned by ignorance, illiteracy, and to a large extent by external forces. For instance, the bombing of Afghanistan in October 2001, which was followed by a reprisal attack by extremists, led to violence and the destruction of places of worship and property. The aftermath introduced tension, mutual suspicion, insecurity, and occasional eruption of violence, as well as mass exodus of people for fear that their fundamental human rights is no longer guaranteed. We want to go back to what the North used to be, where if you say young Ariwa, religion was not a problem. Do your own, I do my own. But let's bring the two together and develop this place. That's it. We have to talk and talk and talk because it is by talking that you uh, influence attitudes. The younger people hear us 
and the, the politicians who are who are mobilizing uh, thugs for their actions will be reminded that this is not helpful. Not only helpful for everybody, but even for them too. Interestingly, there are concerted efforts to get it right. The Nigeria Interreligious Council, NARET, comprising of 25 Christians and 25 Muslims founded in the year 2000, was one of such efforts geared towards fostering religious harmony for peace and development. There are other avenues for interfaith dialogue and programs to create a better atmosphere of mutual enrichment. A practical pointer of interfaith unity was the number one building on Malofashi Street in Area 11, Gurki, Abuja, owned by the National Heart Commission that shared part of it with the Christian Pilgrims Commission before moving to its permanent site. What we are saying in essence is that the both religions have common futures. Now futures brings in unity. First and foremost, we are Nigerians, Christian or Muslim. Then at the same time, we are serving one God. We will do things together, like when screen of air carriers, those that want to relieve people to go to Saudi Arabia. We invite our Christian counterpart to come and witness our inaugural flight and screen of the those that we, that will airlift the people. When they do their house too, they also invite us and we go. Let the world just note this: that is not religion that is causing problem in the in, in Nigeria and in the world. It is the devil, and whoever is doing that, uh, we must not name that person as a religious person. We must name that person as a criminal, and he must receive the punishment or the reward of a criminal. There are schools of thought that believe politically induced crises are often mistaken for religious challenges, but that the religious leaders do compromise. It is important for a clergy to understand his distinct role of being independent of any interest, political, economic or whatever, but look at the spirituality of the people and what will uplift their own well-being. Because the polarization of our pulpits, the polarization of our homilies, the polarization of religious preachings are some of the reasons why we find ourselves in this mess. Don't compromise with them. Don't look at whatever they want to give to you. We'll be looking at what God has in reserve to give to you. Whatsoever a man sow, he reaps. If you use religion to spread violence, when you get there, violence will take you out. Whatever you do on part, every sow, we are come for it on the day of judgment. To really get it right, many say should include the need to address poverty, restore moral values, especially of the family, and for Christian and Muslim religious education be tailored in such a way as to promote mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. But can Nigeria ever be the same again? Talati Ezerike, NTA News. That report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let's uh, start off by introducing our guest to you. We'd like to welcome to this program Archbishop John Priest Daniel. He's a uh, presiding bishop of Dominion Chapel here in Abuja uh, as a Pentecostal prelate of Northern Nigeria, also a member of the National Executive Council of uh, the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN. Thanks for being here, Bruce. Thank you. Let me also welcome to this program uh, Dr. Bashir Isiaku. Is uh, the CEO of Even Development Projects. That's one of the NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations, that brokered lasting peace in Kaduna State over the protracted ethno-religious violence uh, that engulfed the state. Uh, Dr. Bashir Isiaku is also a member of the organizing committee of the recently held International Conference on Peace in Abuja. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We'd like also to welcome Pastor Dr. James Movell Wye, Co-Executive Director, Interfaith Mediation Center, Kaduna. He was one of the facilitators of the Kaduna Peace Declaration of Religious Leaders in 2002. Dr. James Movell Wye, thanks for being with Peace us. Peace be with you. Thanks for having us. And also here with us is Imam Dr. Mohammed Nurain Ashafa. Also co-executive director of the Interfaith Mediation Center, Kaduna, uh, as well as uh, uh, a facilitator also of the Kaduna Peace Declaration of Religious Leaders 2002. Uh, thank you for being with us here. Uh, Salam alaikum, uh, viewers. Thank yes. you for having us around. Yes, I, I should just go ahead and mention that both uh, 
Pastor James Mavel Wye and uh, Imam Muhammad Nurain Ashafa, well known as the two uh, usually referred to as the pastor and uh, imam. Uh, this is arising from their work in the Interfaith Mediation Center of Kaduna. Thanks once again for being with us here. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, we always acquaint you with how the program goes, and uh, we never tire of saying this. At the appropriate time, you can get to join in the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screen. You can take advantage of that. But for those who will be phoning in, let's repeat this as we always do. If you do get through on the phone, do us a favor. Turn down the volume of your TV set. That's the only way we can avoid the hurlback. And once you get through, just go straight ahead to your question or comment because there are so many people waiting uh, to join in the discussion as well. Uh, you'll get to see your name on the screen. That signifies that your call has been taken. So just go ahead and make your contribution. Ask a question or make a comment on the issues at stake. All right. So once again, welcome to NTA Tuesday Live. And let's begin to look at the issue tonight. Well, from the background report we all saw there, um, virtually everyone who spoke in that report talked about the good old days when people were together. It didn't matter what uh, faith you practiced. People stayed together. They regarded themselves as brothers and sisters. But along the lines, this changed. And so let's start off tonight by wondering how that cordial and harmonious relationship disappeared and gave way to distrust, mistrust, and what we're seeing today. Bishop John Praise. I b believe that um, somehow people became conscious of themselves and selfish and then wanted to promote their own agenda. And so they thought the best tool to use is religion and um, brought in the tool of religion to cause disharmony. And uh, because I remember when we were growing up as young children, during Salah time, you will expect the ram and, uh, and other stuff from, from family, Muslim families around the same environment you live. And during festivities like Christmas, you know, you also cook and send to them. So we all shared all those common celebrations and ceremonies together. And uh, so I just think along the line, we missed it when people became selfish and... Uh, Ignorance also took advantage because I, I believe that uh, people began to use people who were less knowledgeable about religion and began to you know, in, uh, use them to incite violence and, and, and to do things which neither the Bible nor the Quran teaches. So I think that's where the problem came along the line. All right. Thanks for your comments. Dr. Bashiri Siaku, let's hear from you. The opening comments. Uh, uh, thank you. Religion in Nigeria has always been what it is, Christianity, Islam, and many others. But uh, in the last few years, I believe the various religions have been grossly commercialized. And that is the beginning and the basis of all the problems we had. People were actually cashing in on the religious differences cashing in on the ignorance of the followers and their vulnerability and using that to cause disaffection within the same religions or uh, between uh, different... Of course, we are still working on the situation. That's my opening comment. Thank you very All much. All right. Well, um, Dr. Mohammed Nurein Ashafa. Well, for me, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, for me, the very important thing is the politicization of religion and religionization of the political process. This was the key bane. And we can always remember that with Islam only and I found Jesus from late 1980s, from the late 1970s, early 1980s. These two important phenomena, the development of politicization of religion, gave the strong bane that the political process come in and then of course misuse and abuse not only the ordinary citizens but including the, the religious leaders become tools in the hand of political actors and from there we miss it and we get it wrong. But interestingly, 
Um, now that you speak of uh, Christianity and Islam, both have prescribed guidelines of how society should be run. And so what was the position of the clerics then that they somehow acquiesced and let the politicians, if we are to say the politicians manipulated them? What happened to their teachings? What happened to their background? I think um, we have to come to the level of understanding that when you do not have enough knowledge of the faith you practice, you can easily be taken into delusion. And um, so knowing the tenets of the faith and what your faith teaches and the doctrines of it, uh, it's very important. Some people now began to take it to the extreme and uh, begin to think that that is what the faith teaches. I, I remember in Christianity, you know, we began to have these teachings, you know, when they slap you on one cheek, mm -hmm. turn the other cheek <clears throat> also. And that's what the scripture says. But then we also got to the extent of being pushed to the wall, like some people will say. Well, they have slapped all the two cheeks, and there's no other cheek to turn. So what mm -hmm. do you do? You do as occasion offers. And like some people will say, as the spirit directs you, when the devil comes, resist him. He says, the Bible didn't tell you how to resist the devil. So I think some of these misinterpolations came in. And I think at a point to some people failed that, you know, their religion were like they were seen like underdogs. And uh, and so when things happen that way, they were always on the receiving end. So that became a problem. And they were now ready to combat, to resist, and to fight back, which I believe shouldn't have been the case. Mm -hmm. It will follow the path of peace. And just like the Christian teaching, we don't really have any place in the scriptures where the Bible tells us to fight back. Okay? But, you know, we reach a place or a point, some Christians will tell you, who can just stay and see us being killed and our people being eliminated? What do we do? So at a point, as a cleric, you are the fix of what to advise at such a time. So these are some of the things that came in. Uh, Dr. Isiaku, something has always uh, uh, bothered me about it. Now, you, you were key to promoting peace and, um, you know, brokering lasting peace in somewhere that, you know, would have been described ordinarily as a hotbed. But something always, you know, bothers me about this. Mm. This is mostly about the two, if you like, main religions of Islam and Christianity. You do have... Nigerians, many of many Nigerians who practice what's known as uh, the traditional religions. We don't see them taking up arms. So what's it that stops them from doing that? And besides, you do find that even for the majority who profess Christianity and Islam, in the dark recesses of their homes, they resort to those traditional religions. Why is this so? Uh, thank you. Uh, as far as uh, the two major religions are concerned, Islam and Christianity, uh, the scriptures have been the same. I would want to say more specifically about Islam because I'm a Muslim and uh, I am aware that since the beginning of Islam, uh, during the times of the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the, the religion has been dynamic. The Holy Quran is fixed. And then the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But of course, it allows for some flexibility and dynamism that will conform to the dictates of times. So this scriptures have been the same. The problem is the followers and the leaders, the religious people, as you described them. Somewhere along the line, we are corrupted by the political class because the political class took advantage of, of their incapability to defend the faiths they were representing. I'll give you a simple example of Kaduna State. There was a situation where uh, Kaduna is more like a mini Nigeria, very, very heterogeneous, with over 200 
different ethno-religious groups. And with the advent of the political uh, times in 1999, politicians started to appeal to the sentiments of the different individuals. Why allow a Christian? Why allow a Muslim? Why not a Bajuman? Why not an Ikuluman? And so on. And like I said in my introductory remarks, there are very huge commercial fortunes tied to this. And because of that, they continue to manipulate the citizens until we found ourselves where we are today. But during the course of the discussions, mm -hmm. I will tell you how some of us join hands as individuals and as groups, and we partnered with the state government and some international agencies like the USAID to trace the origins of this, pluck them, clean them up, and eventually got the citizens to come back to their senses. But it has not been an easy task. Mm -hmm. And I hope and I am confident that it will not occur again. Uh, in more recent times, you will recall that, let's say five, six years ago, something even more deadly than the, the, the differences and disharmony between Muslims and Christians came into being, the Boko Haram, the insurgency. People were using the name of Islam to hide behind it and kill, maim, steal, and commit all sorts of crimes. And this is one of the main reasons why uh, Jamaat Izal Tibera come to Sunnah in collaboration with the World Muslim League organized uh, recently the International Conference on Peace and Harmony in Nigeria, of which I am the secretary of the main organizing committee. We are deeply concerned that why should, why should individuals and groups, and unfortunately, uh, not only individuals and groups, but organizations, faceless organizations, maybe people in authority hiding behind in, uh, the facets of religion, not only to cause disharmony, but to cause destructions and destroy lives. Recently, one of the newspapers reported that Borno State lost about 1.9 trillion Naira, which is about one third of the total Nigerian budget. Borno State alone lost this to Boko Haram. Now, this is only material loss. Uh, we cannot, nobody can quantify how many human beings have been killed. Nobody can quantify how many people are refugees now in their own homes. These are serious problems which Nigerians should address, and not only Nigerians, but the whole world should address because it at one time reached a proportion that we were exporting these acts of transgression to our neighboring countries. Niger Republic, uh, Chad Republic, Cameroon, Protocol Area, and so on. I'm so happy to say that uh, the conference we held was able to find solutions and lasting solutions to these kind of problems. I am willing to share mm -hmm. with my colleagues here and the viewers yeah, what we are able to do. Certainly we'll come to that. Thank um, you. But Pastor James, we, let's look at it from two angles. First, is it that... Um, some of the things happening today were not envisaged by the scriptures and the religions. In other words, in a fast-changing world that has been taken over by technology, is it that these things were not envisaged? I mean, because you can see that technology has also helped to cause, I mean, to, to, to spread, when, when, when uh, something happens in a place, within seconds, people have access to post it on the web and uh, people's opinions, people can skew anything. So we'll look at that. Is it that this was not envisaged, that man's own ingenuity 
you know, and brilliance would now turn and work against him. That's on the one leg. Thank and you it, very yes, much. Okay. This is a very nice question. Um, recently at the UN, we were at this CVE, Countering Violence Extremism, where we spoke and represented this country. And uh, about two weeks back, we are at, at another meeting. Now the, the, the narratives have changed from countering violent extremism to preventing violent extremism. We explore different measures of how these recruitments are done, what are the roles of religious leaders, what should we be doing, how to get systems in place to create new narratives other than the one that is aimed at dehumanizing, creating pains in the minds of people, or attracting young followers into joining groups otherwise, where they will be brainwashed and uh, manipulated. This is envisaged by the Christian theology, because we have the eschatological teachings that perilous times will come, where some of these happenings will be taking place. So how do we counter this? is to re-strategize, work together as people of faith to address these things that we see every day. Coming to the issue of uh, the, the, uh, what our colleague talked about, uh, the current programs they have in Kaduna, how I wish they invited me and other Christians to rub minds together and see how we can navigate through these troubled waters together as an interfaith platform. And then that will be more pragmatic but I remember back uh, some years back when the same group collaborated with the Sultanate. I was invited to Sokoto, where I presented as World Muslim League. My letter was even written in Arabic. Somebody translated, where I spoke to over two to three hundred imams and top Muslim clerics. There we we started building bridges to understand that these differences are caused by certain factors, which I have earlier mentioned conflict entrepreneurs. These narratives and counter narratives that tend to uh, allow manipulation of the religious books for personal gains or for the purpose of somebody was saying if you want me to make, uh, make uh, a situation for you uh, allowable or not allowable uh, I can make it depending on what I want to present and what mm -hmm. I want to market. So we have ready tools in hands who are able to pay uh, what the pipers want to, uh, I mean, to dictate what the piper uh, want to, to blow to the people, to the music. And having done this, we felt strongly that this work can be taken further because I do remember after the signing of the peace declaration in Kaduna in 2002, for nine years, Kaduna experienced peace because religious leaders, uh, 22 of them came and signed. Uh, there were Jamaat uh, al Islam, there is Khan, representative and other clerics. They signed to stay in peace in Kaduna and Kaduna remained peaceful until the unfortunate 2011 post-election violence. Similarly, in, in Shandam, you know Shandam that is notorious for violence. All the violence in Plateau State, it never got to Yelwan Shandam because the people there also signed what we call Shandam Peace Affirmation, where they signed to be at peace. The troubles areas are there, yet it remains calm. So what am I trying to say here? Of course, I don't want to talk about our exploit in Chad, that we exported bad stories. We also took good things to Chad and got the religious leaders in Chad to prevent the escalation of violence from CAR into Chad by using religious leaders. So there is power in our spirituality. If the religious leaders want to stop anything, they can stop it. We can stop the violence once we come together and join our hands together to do this as possible. Okay, I'm taking up from that last statement of yours. So what then seems to be the problem? Why are the leaders not in a, why are they not you know, pushing to stop this violence? I think there, there, you know, there are three type of religious leaders. One would easily call them the good, the bad, and the ugly of religious leaders. When I talk of the good, the bad, and the ugly religious leaders here, the first important one is, of course, are the good religious leaders. These are ideal, the role model, such as our bishops here who say, look, this was what we are. 
people have been manipulating, interpreting, misdirecting this energy negatively, it's supposed to be positive energy. And they know them for that. They are a living episodes. They are a role model of our religious traditions as Muslims or Christians. Then the second one, the, the bad ones, are the incapable religious leaders. They have half knowledge, incomplete, imperfect knowledge of the theology, of their theology within their traditions. But there's so much in a hurry to put the regalia of the imam, to call themselves sheikhs. They are so much in a hurry to be the imam in the mosque. They are so much in a hurry to start giving fatwas on what they don't even have the clear, basic, deeper knowledge of understanding the context. As we just talked about the, the, the global age, the digital age, this, the global economic, a mobile economic system. Then he was so much in a hurry to give a fatwa. What to give for zakat, what not for zakat, or what to do or what not to do. What is halal and what is haram. These guys, the, he's sincere, but ignorantly sincere. Causing more harm than pains. That is the bad one. But the ugly one, he's a moving encyclopedia. He turned halal into haram and make haram into halal. He's anywhere you ask him for any evidences. He will substantiate, produce effective evidences beyond reasonable doubt to woo you out of the track. These are the type of people whom Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us clearly as Muslims that the end will not turn. Ulama usui. These are wicked religious leaders who will take preeminent in the public square. And it is their voices that people, unfortunately, some people want to hear more of their voices. And they expand more of their voices of this ugly and the bad religious leaders instead of the ideal role model because their language is not given. They will say their preaching is not giving the kick. Even the youth say, bah, bah, you know, it's not giving us enough kick. So we don't want to hear that. Let's go to that malam who will condemn the other groups, who always have evidences to condemn the other, right. to demonize the other. These are the key challenges we have. Okay. All right. Okay, well, the phone lines are already open, and uh, we have the first call coming through from Abuja here. Victor, I believe, calling in from Abuja. Hello, Victor, go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Good evening, and um, good evening to everyone in the studio. Right. Um, first of all, I'd like to, you know, just uh, bounce in and uh, talk about the issue of um, the use of technology within the country. Um, I think we really need to, you know, first of all, have... Uh, an effective framework that governs and regulates the use of technology within the country, um, be it emerging or other well-known kinds of technologies. And we also need to, in, in regulating or in having this framework, we need to look at issues that border on ethical, human rights, dignity, privacy, security, and safety issues, and, and then tell us this, this use of technology towards positive outcomes within the country. Uh, that's one. Uh, secondly, I think we also need to look at the, you know, um, the issue of what actually, what are the issues that drive conflict within Nigerian societies. Uh, in Nigeria, I mean, everyone talks about God. When we talk about God in this country, one would think that Nigeria would, you know, would be one of the best countries in the world. Uh, because, we, I mean, everyone talks about, I mean, in every conversation we have in this country, people say God. Unfortunately, even the, even the pastors and the imams don't seem to live up to that bidding, unfortunately. I mean, they, 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 a pastor talks about God now, and he turns around and he simply does something contrary to the God he was talking about, and that becomes an issue. And, um, and, and secondly, I think people misunderstand the tenets of true religion. What is religion, actually? Is religion about conflict? Religion is so simple. It's just about love and where we communicate with the one who is above us. I mean, therefore, if the religion is about this, we need to be able to live together harmoniously in a loving, excellent, wonderful, you know, kind way, without just really having to, you know, you know, to get into the ring, boxing each other at all times. So and I think the pastors themselves and the imams need to live by example. Unfortunately, it does appear that politicians use a lot of them. I mean, they, they, they go into these places and they use the name of God to do a lot of things. And, and then they come into the society and they, and, they, they, and they corrupt the entire system. And they go into the churches and the monks and the pastors and the imams embrace them. And so, well done. They don't even want to know where the politicians are getting their millions from. And these are the same politicians that comes, that, 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 
that go into these localities or these societies and create conflicts because of their because of their greed for power, greed for you know for self aggrandizement, greed for all kinds of things. And so therefore I think the pastors and the and the imams need to be able to live to their bidding. Unfortunately they've not been living to their bidding. I mean the, the, the first culprit he should be the pastors and the imams. Frankly speaking, and those who call themselves men of God in this country. Okay. That is where the problem comes from. All right. and, and, and then we also need to be able to have enough jobs for this for the youth around the country because I mean a lot of them are jobless. Mm -hmm. And I don't mind certainly will be used for things like this. I mean we need to be able to have policies that create effective, you know, that create jobs that you know we have millions and millions of children coming out of school every year. And it drives it, it drive a lot, it, it, it drives to the university and you see the number of students in this and you wonder, where would, just, where would we get just for them? You know, so we need to, pull, we need to put an effective framework to be able to deal with these things. Uh, okay. I hope I'm not being too long with this serial. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful evening. And right, thank you, Victor. <coughs> uh, just about mentioned uh, <laughs> virtually everything here, the unemployment, the, the inducement, uh, pecuniary inducements, and of course, um, Lots of uh, the leaders themselves have derailed. But that's just one aspect of it. We'll come to some of the issues that Victor has raised now, but that's just one aspect. It's also known that one of the fastest ways uh, to, uh, to have what you want in Nigeria today is if you don't play up the religious sentiment, then you play up the ethnic sentiment. If I can't yeah. get... Yes. <laughs> that's, yeah. Yeah, that's what, uh, that's mm. what we mm. try to address. Okay in our conference on peace and nation building. Right. Uh, I'm happy this gentleman, Victor, has highlighted some of these issues of unemployment. And maybe he didn't want to talk about corruption. Mm -hmm. uh, look at, for example, in northern Nigeria. About five years ago, there was a report that there were over 12 million almajiris. Almajiris, the ones you see at the filling station, on the streets, begging, roaming about. In my opinion, this is uh, a very serious act of child abuse. Mm. It is child abuse and it is not permitted by Islam to, to, to throw away your children like that. And it is an obligation on you to take care of your own children and other children as well. Now, uh, those who manipulate religion draw from the pool of al -Majri. Even the Boko Haram, we were told initially, the original Boko Haram, the original Boko Haram, we were told initially, were drawn from the al -Majri because they were brought up in a system that they had no respect for anybody. They had no pity for anyone. Nobody was caring mm -hmm. for them. And so they could kill and could be killed, could be manipulated, could be bought over uh, with stipends. And uh, subsequent government policies were pushing away and making, the, making life more difficult for the parents to, to keep their children to bring them up well to send them to school and even when they go to school they cannot get jobs and the cycle continued until we found ourselves where we were yesterday and uh, today i'm happy to say we are almost out of it the government of the day has done so much to curb the menace of boko haram that's why i call it yesterday it was so bad and the millions of people uh, really suffered for this. Now, in our conference, the conference which we organized jointly between Izala Tibira and the World Muslim League, we tried to, and we came to three good conclusions. One, that uh, because we had, it was an all-inclusive conference, <coughs> we developed a fatwa. Fatwa in Arabic, uh, in English means a verdict mm -hmm. that Islam does not permit any act of lawlessness. Islam does not permit and does not encourage and it, is, and it should not be used as a cover for these acts of lawlessness. Number two, 
we 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 tried to to make it impossible for anybody to manipulate the public by painting a criminal act with the color of Islam because we brought together all the different groups and sects around Islam. We also brought together so many religious, uh, other religious groups, uh, Christian associations, and uh, we also brought together NGOs, including international NGOs like USAID, Japan Agency for Development, and so on, to all agree. Uh, there is a good list of, of mm. the participants on today's Daily Trust. We published a two-page appreciation for all those who participated and contributed. So, uh, the position of the conference is that Nigerians will no longer accept mm -hmm. to be manipulated or to be deceived in even issues that are meant only to, 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 to corrupt the society and then destroy uh, everybody. Lastly, we also tried to address the issue of non-punishment. When people commit crimes like this, hiding under the cover of religion, and they get away with it, and nobody is punished, it will continue to happen. Yeah. I wrote a book in 1987 about the first religious crisis that occurred in Kaduna, the Kafanchan crisis. I called the book The Kafanchan Carnage. And I made mention in that book how a tribunal of inquiry found some people guilty of not only perpetrating but uh, collaborating to cause the conflict, which resulted in the death of so many innocent citizens. They were convicted, they were sentenced, they even started some jail terms where it was jail terms, and they were pardoned mm. later on. You remember, Pastor? They were pardoned and even given plum appointments some, some, uh, subsequently. Now, that is a very good warning to President Muhammadu Buhari. Now that Boko Haram is over, Nigerians deserve to know who are those behind Boko Haram. Okay. Who are those who perpetrated it? And they have to be punished. It's not a secret trial. It has to be an open kind of uh, 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 trial and the, though whoever is found guilty of perpetrating this must be punished. Okay. If you don't do that, then you are saying somebody else can take advantage of this lapse and do it again. Alright, let's go back to the phones. We have another caller um, calling in from Delta. Stephen, I do believe. Go right ahead, Stephen. Don't do that. Then you are saying yes. somebody else can take advantage of Stephen, there is a hold back. I'm afraid we'll have to cut Stephen off. There's a hold back well, from. Good evening. Yes, good evening. We did say at the start of this program, turn down the volume of your TV. I want to know those Boko Arab, are they not from uh, Muslim? Okay. We'll just take that because that's just the question you've been able to get out through. But we'll have to cut off from Stephen because the whole back is there. Well, straight away, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a question that can be answered straight away. That Boko Haram is not Islam. All right. Boko Haram is not Islam. If no? I have to say it again, yeah. maybe Imam <laughs> should okay. talk about this. The question is very clear. Yes. yes. Is Boko Haram Islam? Mm -hmm. The answer is very clear. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has responded in a very clear terms. He, the, because the assertion that three important thing Muhammad says, he was talking to his companion. He said, no one will enter paradise until he or she have faith. Then he says, no one will have faith until he loves. No one will have faith until he loves. Then he turned to his companion and said, should I teach you how to love? They say, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, exchange peace, the greeting of peace among yourselves. So this summarizes the essence of Islam, that you cannot be a Muslim if you want to enter paradise. And the paradise is your final celestial journey as a dream. The essence is 
if it's a, you must have faith. And your faith is measured by the ability to love, to care, to share with those around you. If you say you have faith and you promote hate, you cause pains and tears in the eyes of others, then that faith is called to question according to Muhammad. Right. And how do you know you have love? Then it means you exchange peace among your followers. So therefore, this was the exact opposite of what, what a brother is asking for. Anybody who claims to be Muslims, if he cause pains and tears to others, then he sees to be Muslims. From that particular moment, he's causing pains and tears to his neighbor. This is just it's a simple elementary and a mathematics that we all need to know. Right. And I'm very happy, not only the, the last conference, many religious leaders have come up boldly to say, no, this is not Islam. And that's why I say, Islamist terrorist, no, Islamist suicide bomber. No, there's nothing Islamist in suicide bombing. A suicide bomber is a criminal, criminal. just as an introduction to the first person. It's a criminal and it's a criminal for a criminal. Yeah. Thank you. Thank right. you very much. Another call coming through. Hello. Hello Kabiru is calling in from Abuja. Kabiru, go ahead. Kabiru. Hello, good evening, everybody. There. Good evening. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to point out some point. I, I believe in what the demand and the needle said about the people who are involved in the issue of Boko Haram. I, due to my own experience in the military, I retired as a military officer. Due to my own experience, I don't think whatever the soldiers say that will take more than one year has a hand in the government. In it. Because I could remember when the issue of Boko Haram started, and they were some of the sources who were caught along Kaduna Abuja Expressway, they named some, some politicians who are involved and they are financing, they are financing them financially. And uh, that was the, the regime of Jonathan. And up to, up to Jonathan left the seat, nothing was done to those people who I call out. And okay, come to think of it, the issue of the Zuki. If a president will find out a huge amount of money, of money for ammunition, and that ammunition will be used for politics and campaign. So what are we talking about? Okay. So right. what are we talking about here? So we, we should not put something about being a religion of being Muslim or Christian. Come to think of it. Most of the people who I kill in Meduguri are 90% Muslim, not even Christian. Okay. And go back and watch three years ago of the CD during the Jonathan regime, the mobile police who were sent to Meduguri were killing the innocent and imagine calling them suspected Boko Haram. So a lot of things is happening in this country who is just upside down. I'm sorry to say. Okay. Thank you very much, Kabir. Mostly Islamic bombers and... Uh, this was a story. Come to the, 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 the water center who was bombed in the United States was a hand in the same family of Bush. So whatever that is going upside down, I be, mark it, they, they have a hand in the government in it. Okay. So we should not put sentiment of being Islam or Christianity or whatever people are calling a fight there. So thank oh. you very much. All right. Thank you, Kabir. Uh, a number of tweets have also come in. Um, uh, well, <laughs> some of them are talking about uh, the same issues that have just been uh, highlighted here. Um, um, yes, uh, this Ibrahim says religious harmony is only achievable when youths are carried along as members of religious peace initiatives in Nigeria. Once again, the reference to youths. And uh, if you do have, like um, uh, the uh, word of Akola said, if you do have an army of youths out there who are unemployed, then, of course, um, they become ready recruits for those who want to cause mayhem. Mm. Um, Hama Ali Kwajafa, he asks a question and he says, how is Arabic being a language of communication being misunderstood uh, by many uh, Muslims? And uh, another tweet says, religious leaders can stop the violence if they really want to stop it. Um, these are some of the 
tweets we are receiving from people who are watching. Then Habiba Abdullah, he says, I tell you, religious leaders are the main cause of this problem. No one should just wake no one should just blindly uh, no one should just blindly wake up to be a pastor or imam all right and uh, well of course other other tweets will follow as we uh, as we go on um, this other one says our religious leaders can preach to followers on the need for religious uh, tolerance well and uh, these are the things that yeah, first yeah, thank you so much, Seal. Um, okay, I that, all right, uh, uh, just before you go on, uh, Bishop, is that Solomon is calling in from Joss. Okay, Solomon, let's hear you briefly. Hello, Solomon. Uh, good evening, please. Yes, good evening. I commend you for this laudable program. Hmm. All the speakers are honest and realistic. All right. Oh dear, well. <laughs> well. Since Nigeria has a leader that yes. has the political will to transform the nation, okay. I want to suggest that government and the ideal religious leaders should constitute a committee that will fashion out a law Mm -hmm. that allows for identification of the ugly religious leaders and their subsequent punishment. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Okay. Fine. So, thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Solomon. All right. Thank you. Yes. All right. Bishop. Thank you so much. Um, sincerity of purpose from all of us, the religious leaders. Honesty and... Um, just like my colleague, the Imam, have said. I'm not sure uh, even quite a number of people out there have this understanding, you know, and um, this enlightenment that you have just given to us. And uh, like somebody had asked, you know, is Boko Haram Islamist? You know, and you just readily define. Because from all that we have had and from all the things that happened, you know, somehow in court, People believed that they were fighting an Islamic cause. Mm -hmm. Because from what they say, you know, we fight with, you know, uh, Boko Haram, that is, uh, uh, Western education is bad. And yet, they use Western education to communicate through their phones and through the things that happen. So it's all part of the ignorance. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say that uh, <laughs> Boko Haram is, is I mean, uh, is Haram, Boko is Haram. And, and, and then it's still the same instruments we are using. The gun you are using to fight was still produced through Western technology. So there is, that's the ignorance. That's the problem. So I think it's the wrong teaching, the rate of poverty and the sincerity among our religious leaders. Even the interreligious council. Amazingly, sometimes we'll sit around the table, Christians and Muslims and and the Christian Association of Nigeria, the Supreme Islamic Council, I mean the Supreme Islamic, I mean the uh, Council of Islam, Council for Islamic, for Islamic Affairs. Affairs. Mm. You know, why do we go back to teach our people? Do we reprimand them? Do we tell them this is bad, this is wrong? Just like some of I mean, the Imam have said. So if we the leaders can be sincere in the teachings and by giving direction to our people and come out vehemently condemn it. I remember when Boko Haram started, we didn't have too many religious leaders, Islamic religious leaders condemning it. I mean, I may be wrong. But if we have had our fathers in the faith, in the Islamic faith, coming out and say, this is not Islam, this is not Islam, then and condemn it so vehemently, I'm sure. And the Christian leaders too stand up and say, look, Christians, don't go out there and fight because nobody can fight for God. You know, we we'll have been able to cut these things much, much easy. The man, the other man said, maybe in my degree, maybe about 90%, uh, I mean, maybe because quite Islamic, they're quite uh, large. But I know quite a number of churches, from over two, 3,000 churches in Borno State and those uh, southeastern states were, were lost. And several hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Christians also died. So, But I think uh, the, uh, the, 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 the religious leaders will have come out vehemently and condemn it and will say, this is not Islam. This is not what uh, the, uh, the Holy Prophet Muhammad taught. 
And this is completely different. And when that was done, I mean, that is done, a lot of things probably will have been said. But I'm glad that we are all coming out now to condemn it. And uh, somebody said, Boko Haram is ended. I, I really pray that it, be, it, it, that it ends. Because people are still being killed, so we're still praying. But quite a lot has happened with this present regime. Uh, the, 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 the president has tried. But we still believe that it will really come to an end completely. When we will not have killings again going on. Okay, yes, we have yes. from Lagos. Uh, Chris, who's calling in from Lagos. Chris, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Just go ahead. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Go ahead. Hello. Good evening, Cyril. Good evening. Good evening to your guests. Can you hear me? Yes. yes just go ahead. go ahead. Okay. I, I think that the topic you're discussing is fundamentally important for our country. And I believe that uh, your guests are doing quite um, some good justice to it. But I think that what we must begin to do as a people and as a nation is to, uh, first of all, learn to tell our children the truth. Uh, Muslims and Christians are children of the same parent, the same father. Um, the Muslims call him Ibrahim. Christians call him Abraham. And we are custodians of uh, a common faith that uh, comes from the Almighty God. I think a part of our problem as uh, humans is that um, we tend towards supremacist teachings. Some Christians will say that their God is superior, that Jesus is superior, and some will say that Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, is superior. And I disagree with anybody who comes from that perspective. And this is what we must begin to tell our children. That uh, be you Jews, Gentiles, Christians, uh, I know that Surah 2 verse 62 talks about uh, the believers, those who follow the books, the Muslims, the Serbians, and the Christians. And it says to all of them, they will inherit a portion in paradise, in our Jannah. So essentially what we must begin to do is to teach children, teach the young to think about Law fundamentally, because that's the summum bonum. Love is the major essence of life. Love is the reason we're here. We're here to experiment, to be like God, to learn to love our brothers and our sisters, to learn to believe in our country and live together as one. And that's what we must begin to teach our people. It's uh, beyond um, uh, sentiments and tendencies. We must learn to love each other. That's the golden rule. It applies to Islam, it applies to Christianity, it applies to Buddhism, it applies to every religion under the sun. You know, uh, the fundamentals of religion is what we must begin to teach. Our brothers teach our sisters, teach everybody who lives in this country. And once we do that, you find out that those who share the tendencies of the Haramist will lose the fire. Those who share extremist tendencies will lose the fire. And ultimately, we'll have a country that, uh, that lives and thrives in peace. And we will have a country that will proudly um, live in as children of one God. I think that is fundamentally what uh, the clergy, uh, be the Muslim, be the Christians, must begin to teach our children and our people. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, at this point... We'll take, a, we'll take a short break. When we return, we'll look at other factors which have led to the continuing violence and the breakdown in peace and harmony in society. Stay with us tonight to your Tuesday Live. We'll be back shortly. Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects and movements to the police and other security agencies. 
The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. Nigeria Unite Against Terrorism This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood. We cannot at this point in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. Make you report any crooked person, object, or work at Jube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so, plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. The Federal Minister of Information and Culture bring on this message. NTA Tuesday Live, a network issue-oriented innovation talk show. All right, thanks for staying with us. We're looking at uh, Interfaith Unity on NTA Tuesday Live, and um, some of our viewers have raised the question of uh, having an army of youths unemployed, and uh, some of the tweets we also got talked about involving the youths in everything we do in looking, searching for a solution to the crisis. And... Uh, Let's hear from you, Pastor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, the youths, in our program of training of leaders for religious and national coexistence tagged tolerance, which of course graciously supported by USID, which we are doing in five, six states, Borno, Bauchi, uh, Kaduna, Kano, Sokoto, you see why Sokoto, Plachi State. We were targeting youths and religious leaders to inculcate in them values of coinage, to deepen our religion in order to deepen the understanding of peace. Now, leaders have been trained severally. And recently, we're doing what we call North-South Dialogue, uh, moving people from Southeast to Northeast, Northeast to Southwest. And this is also graciously supported by USID. Why am I saying this? Um, there are hate and dangerous speeches on there. And young people, when there are these hate speeches, the young people see it as a guarantee to ventilate uh, anger on people that are perceived as uh, uh, enemies. Something happened on the street of Kaduna by an Okada man and uh, an Igbo guy. Somebody was saying, look, you say you want Biafra, right? I don't want to use the house word for it, but this is what will come on you. It became worrisome. So we set up what we call an early warning, early response system. We call Community Peace Observer, mm. where we filter information, decode information, record information, and send blast to counteract those kind of hate and dangerous among young people. So using the tweets, Twitter, and other social media in addressing issues that are related to youths. It's ongoing. In universities, about 41 universities have been targeted by uh, the, our activities, where we also show the film as a model. Imam and I can be worse enemies, but now friends. It means that it is possible to, to live in diversity, yet be conscious. I think this is important for Nigerians that we should go beyond tolerance and accept that we differ 
in our spirituality, yet we, for the common good of Nigerian, we can be together. Nigerian is notoriously godly, but, you see, uh, religious, but somehow our godliness can be, uh, we're not very godly entirely, yeah, but, but some the, are godly. Yeah, but so, that's the question people yeah. have always asked and so, said, look, every, every nook and cranny of this country you go to, you're like finding Moscow, places of worship, yes. people professing, yes. and yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the fundamentals are, are, are left. Uh, you see, in recent times, there are attempts even to eliminate the teaching of religious studies in primary and secondary, secondary schools. schools. This is a very, very dangerous trend. Yeah. If you do that, and I hope the Minister of Education is hearing me, mm -hmm. <laughs> You have been a writer, you have been a scholar. Yeah. You know, it is very dangerous to eliminate the teachings of religious doctrines. But you can review the doctrines and teach them the pristine and correct teachings, yeah. the correct curriculum. I remember uh, in, in some, year, some years back, when attempts were made to destroy the teachings of religion, at that level. Uh, religious classes were taken to the end of the day. We used to have our IRK lesson at mm -hmm. about 2 o'clock. When we were hungry, we were tired, tired. and mm -hmm. we were just anxious to go. Mm -hmm. So we were not learning anything. And they were recruiting, let me say, uh, the, 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 the wretched among the teachers mm -hmm. to teach. And uh, teach, Islamic teachers were errand boys sent away, Anakalahu, they were called, you know. And of course, there were many schools where they were not, they were not even teaching uh, Bible studies. Mm -hmm. Now, if you do that, that is how the society was breeding, especially among the youths and the elites, people who had no sense of God, but could pretend Right. To be men of God, yeah. 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 and when you ask them to uh, to to uh, to respect the rights and the differences with others, they only respect what they can do to line their pockets. Yeah. Doctor Bashir, you see the issue of that teaching is cardinal. Mm. I want to see a situation where the schools that are in the south, if there is one Muslim, give him uh, an Islamic teacher to teach him Very in good. the north. Where there are also, schools, if yeah. there is one Christian, give him an Islamic, uh, a Christian yeah. teacher to teach, teach him. him. We need to saturate the situation with true teaching of these faiths, not manipulated by a few individuals. But when you do one side and you don't do the other side, people begin to read minutes. I think the Minister of Education is listening and he should take this seriously. Mm. All right, Imam. We see that um, the home, as everyone has identified here, has a key role to play here. Is this something we have lost from the cradle? Absolutely. I feel we have lost a big, a big chunk of the challenges we saw today happen from home. Mm -hmm. In those days when we were children, we are taught to mold house, to mold a bed, to make the bed fly. And when we mold the bed with the clay and we keep it, if anything happens, we cry because our bed has been broken. The leg is broken. We build houses. We build. We don't destroy. This is what we are taught when we are children. But the children we are giving back to today, you see a child, you give him a gun. And he started shooting the gun. You give him this, uh, I don't know how they call it, the digital boys. <laughs> what they use. They put a car running video, over speed. Video, game. video games. Mm -hmm. And all these video games are blood, 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 blood. Right from child infancy. The boy begin with blood, kicking, shooting, and he come and tell you, say, hey, daddy, sleep, sleep. I'm shooting you, sleep, sleep. Daddy, if you don't daddy. die, daddy, die, daddy, die. <laughs> when, you the, when the child grow with this, tell me the humanity, you remove his humanity. And secondly, most of us as parents, we've do, we've, we are so much engrove with looking for material kingdom. So much of material kingdom that we don't know enough is enough. And when we don't know enough is enough, we will never have enough. Mm -hmm. And we saw reality today. And that's why most of our children, even from we abandon them, that some of us who are excessively rich, 
you see that the most spoiled children today, what they call the BB children, the Blackberry children, they are the most spoiled children are the children of those who have enough to eat to take care of themselves. Why is it happening this way? It is because as parents, both the father and the mother, we've abandoned the primary responsibility that God put on our shoulder. And until we pick that, can we mm. fix the society to be a better place? All right. Mm. Back to the phones. From Brendan Kebi, we have Abdulaziz calling in. Hello, Abdulaziz. Yes, Abdulaziz, are you with us? Hello? Yes, go ahead. So my contribution here is that the situation is very, very recent. Because growing up, I'm just 23, growing up, I know it's time when you take a Christian as a brother, right. not an enemy. So the situation is as recent as 10 years back. But there is need for us to look at it from both sides, the Christians and the Muslims. There is need for harmony. Oh dear. Oh, well, we lost that. We lost that call from Abdulaziz. It wasn't too clear, anyway. So, but yes, uh, yes. I, 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 I want to build on the discussion on how to bring back hmm. Nigerians to our senses. You see, there's a lot of work that will have to be done to reorient the society. Uh, still on this issue of Boko Haram. How is it possible that Nigerians were taken for granted to be told that poor uh, Almajiris who are said to be going barefooted could afford to import explosives and bomb places like Yenyen, Emma Plaza, UN office, and so on? How did they import these things into the country? There are customs, police, uh, the, at one time, there, there, was, there were conflicts, even the inter-agencies, too many agencies at the ports, mm. at the airports, conflicting with, and they still allowed explosives to, to, be, to be imported and be used on innocent citizens. How, who was taking us for granted? Who was taking Nigerians for granted? Nigerians should no longer be taken for granted and then be destroyed and killed under the cover of any religion. And the, 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 the main factor behind it is corruption. We can see from the current investigations going on that people that were entrusted with public funds to procure arms and ammunition to fight and eliminate a, a group of insurgents were busy helping themselves politicking with the money. Now, if, if funds meant to fight Boko Haram could be used for private purposes, then you can imagine funds meant, uh, funds, the same funds could have been diverted. I, I think you just you look know. at that. If you look at, in fact, more <laughs> important here, mm -hmm. look at the area of health sector. Mm -hmm. Look abandoned. at the area of education. All abandoned. There are money invested in education, says to have been invested in educational sectors, mm. invested in health sectors. If you open that aspect also, there's a lot of things going on. Today, yeah. our children in schools, in universities, it is about, it's not about the certificate, it's about pay, cash and carry. Yeah. And they are promoting the concept of cash. For example, let me give one simple example, sir, that is so painful is the issue of uh, WAEC exams. Why should WAEC exam money for me, for my child to go into senior secondary school or graduate from secondary school is varied from 5,000 or 6,000 to about almost 60,000, 70,000 based on which school, how much you paid to get to this. And this, our moral currency, is mm. not called to action. All if right. I can pay 11,000, 5,000 in some school, 6,000, 11,000, 25,000, the more the standard of school, the more your money for WAEC exams. The same applies for NECO. The mm. same applies for JAM. Mm. And you start saying, ah, am I paying for money to buy the form or money to pass the exams? Okay. These are issues of moral currency where if our religiosity cannot correct this, mm. then that religion is called to action. So we Need have a flamboyant lifestyle. Right. The flamboyant lifestyle of Nigeria has, that is why they are using money meant for other things, for other things. 
a debt, we spend a lot. When we are marrying, we spend a lot. You have to keep those traditions, otherwise you are an outcast. So people go along when you have money for certain projects, they, they, they accumulate it because we celebrate wealth. We celebrate from buoyancy. People feel if you don't drive in that car or in that plane, you are not there. So I, I thank God for the war against corruption that is going on here. And I think I, I challenge it, religious leaders. We, we ought to have been doing this. But then we celebrate wealth to a point <laughs> that even if things are brought, we don't question. We just take it. So I congratulate this present administration for its fight against corruption that is going out holistically to reach everyone and correct it. And religious leaders, you are part of those in the committee against corruption, which I used to be before, mm -hmm. is to say that we ought to go out and support the government All against right. corruption mm -hmm. and religious yeah. violence and dialogue will take a proper course. Recently, okay. we we'll started off something with the American Embassy. Okay, we'll, we'll come to that fight. quickly. Let's see, look, uh, from Lokoja, Mohammed has been waiting on the line. Mohammed calling in from Lokoja. Hello? Hello? Do we still have, do we still have Mohammed on good the evening. line? Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Good evening. Hmm. Hello, good evening. Good evening, go You're ahead. Welcome. Hello, good evening. Go You're good welcome. evening. Yes, good evening. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. How are you? Talk Fine. <laughs> uh, I am happy with this uh, program. I am happy with this program. Hello? Oh, we are yeah. hearing you. Carry on. Just speak on, speak on. Speak and on. again, if you look at it, if you look at it, I think the contribution is very important. And uh, in addition to what you have said, you see, the contribution of religion institution towards advancement or development of society cannot be overemphasized. If you look at it critically, you can't leave the responsibility of training children in your society to the religion just alone. The, 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 the teachers in our various institutions has to be aligned to their responsibility. Take, for instance, those who are to train the leaders of tomorrow, if you look at them by characteristic, are corrupt. Their moral standing is so low. Today, students believe on malpractice before they pass examination. People give money to pass examination. It's an unfortunate situation in this country. What is the benefit of reading? Whereby this, a, a, somebody is saying that they will copy the examination on the board for him to write. No more hard working. When we are in the secondary school, there are these classes of education, like uh, introductory technology. For those who have the knowledge of technology, they go to that particular aspect, like uh, mental work, technical drawing, or woodwork. And those who are science inclined, read science. So, but today, all those things are no longer there. The government is not paying attention to the educational system. Hmm. If you look at our university system now, they are just graduating job seekers, not job employers. <laughs> if, if, you, if you look at it today, we say knowledge for creativity. You don't see uh, our graduates in our, in, from our various institutions who can create a job. All they do is to depend on government, and government cannot provide jobs. And if you look at the, 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 the entire situation, even when the religious leaders are trying to inculcate moral value, at our various institutions, the teachers are destroying it. All those ones are unfortunate situations. And you say you want to train leaders of tomorrow, and whereby those, leader, those, those students are not being given moral training. We learn from our primary school, that uh, uh, the labor of a hero past shall never be in vain. Did we abide by that dictate? Mm. We don't see ourselves as one. Mm. In fact, sometimes when I look at it, I say, do we have Muslims in this country or do we have Christians? Because if you look at what the two religions teach, it's unity, stability. But today you see the kind of attitude of eh, the young boys involving in uh, end smokers, drinking alcohol, Secret society. Did you leave it for the institution alone? The parent doesn't have any responsibility. All those things are the problem in our society. So we must search our conscience. 
If we want Nigeria to develop, we must be hardworking, we must be determined, and we must ensure the unity of our country irrespective of the religion. Not minding you being a Christian or a Muslim, you are talking of Nigeria as a country, and you look at yourself, what is your duty to your country? All right. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Mm. Thank you. All right. I have my way. <laughs> I will have said it is the religious leaders that have betrayed Nigeria. They handed oh. over uh, the country to the politicians in many ways. For example, let me start with the, with the Muslim leaders. You will find when atrocities like Boko Haram were being committed, some groups were even celebrating and accusing one group or the other of being Boko Haram. Instead of declaring mm. that uh, it was uh, evil. an evil mm. that must be done away with, they were trying to pinpoint or assign or attribute Boko Haram to, to other groups. At the same time, they were busy going to visit uh, government houses to break their fasts. You can imagine that you want to go and break your fast. Of course, it is not just breaking the fast. It carried its along with it's so many other things. Mm. Uh, if you go to break your fast with the president or with the governor and, um, and then walk away just like that without directing him to do what is right, that is a betrayal of the society. Mm -hmm. If I come back to the Christian uh, leaders also, Archbishop, please bear with me. It is painful. Go ahead. You are flying aircrafts, <laughs> so many aircrafts, so private many jets, private that jets, that's right, okay. not you, but some of right. the real leaders, you know? <laughs> yeah. That is also uh, a, a very, you know, a very good way of uh, betraying the faith and the followers. Okay. You know, when, when the religious leaders are displaying flamboyant and uh, uh, a kind of... Uh, a psychophantic attitude, then they are no longer men of God. And I, the children... I, I, I really appreciate what uh, Bashir is saying, but I want to disagree with Bashir on this. That when you put a blanket lances to say, we as religious leaders... No, not all I of know you. many religious leaders... Not mm. all of who you. ...who are killed mm. simply because they say Boko Haram. Boko yeah. is Haram is Haram. Yeah. Mm. We have Jafar Adam, you can bear witness to That's this. That's right. He That's was right. murdered because he said... This is not Islam. Yeah. When the boy started, he started crying. This is not Islam. Yeah. This cannot be Islam. He was killed. Yeah. We have many. We have a, tra a, tra a traditional leader in Rigasa who was saying, don't leader. give them houses. They don't belong here. Mm. He, they came to his house at the gunpoint and killed him. Mm. We have many religious leaders we can mention from Meduguri down to this part of the yeah. north who have raised their voices, who have been murdered because they raised their voices. Yeah. But the key important thing, I think, is that our political leaders have betrayed us in okay. the past. And now, there are some few religious leaders who have done that. Mm. This, the excessive, extreme religious leaders who have abused this nation, who have abused the trust of God on their shoulder. We can see them, we can feel them, and my fear is what happened in Europe should not happen here. All because right. when people realize that you are abusing them, you are not really showing them God, you are abusing their love and passion they have for God, they will turn against God. And when they turn against God, they will turn against religious against institutions. Society. And that is the fear I have for our tomorrow. Right. Mm. Uh, Archbishop, in, well, it was uh, in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, you had uh, a popular uh, reggae musician then, and who did uh, a song that was so popular then, Stealing in the Name of, in the, name of God. Uh, in, in the Name of the Lord. And yes. um, there were analogies drawn even from the scriptures. We are quoting a section. It said, My Father's House of Worship has become a den of thieves. Now, let's return to this issue of ostentatious living, uh, the display of wealth, mm -hmm. which, of course, has been identified as one of the factors. Young people, they see a lot of money all over the place, and um, they, want to, they want to go for it. Yes, and you yeah. find this even among the clergy themselves. Yeah. I think, um, let me come well, from Well, you know, because angle. someone has drawn attention to the fact yeah. of Prosperity, prosperity, 
And not anything about you know, even the real teachings. Yeah, the real teaching, the faith, the, faith. the spirituality. Mm. Now, um, in everything, this has to be balanced. What has even brought discrepancy that we see is poverty. Because in the Western world, in America, you drive your Jeep. Nobody even cares you drive a Jeep. Because small boys of 18, 20 years, they can drive the best of cars. Everybody have the roads, they have the best of cars, and have the, they stay the best of houses. So the system there has been able to level up for everybody. The gap the, the, for between the rich and the poor has been breached. Mm. Here, uh, people are seen to drive big cars, so-called, because of the rate of poverty that is in the land. If we are able to balance all, I mean, I just said the kind of millions we call this in Nigeria, is it? This $2 billion we are talking about, which was meant for arms. If you translate that, you're talking about six trillion naira or something. Mm. And we have just about 170 million Nigerians. <laughs> Can the government in a while, in a moment take, just say, okay, let every Nigerian be entitled sure. to 10 million. Sure, Go does. and invest or build a house. Make sure we have a house. We have, if you have seven children, each of them 10 million. How much would that come to? Multiply that by 170 million. So the poverty level has been the problem. And the politicians have taken advantage of that because they i said the reason why the fight against corruption is very laudable and welcome is because if money is not in few hands money will be in many hands oh, yes. and everybody will feel you know that this country takes care of their needs they have a place to sleep they have food to eat they can send their children to school as we are talking now there are very very few nigerians who can eat a good square meal a day Many of us that have, I mean, that in a little way we can assist, you know, the calls we receive almost every day from people who can send their children to school and all. So I think it's the poverty in the land. And the government must do everything possible to bridge the gap. Ostentious living, it's, it's, it's relative. In court, I can say in court. Because it, uh, I am not projecting that people should live, you know, just anyhow. Take advantage of the rule you lead and then and, and leave above whatever. No, that's not what I'm saying. But there are also instances in which people, because the problem of the level of what they are doing and the things they do, they have need for this. Like I have somebody I respect, one of my father in the faith, Pastor Yadeboy. He has churches in almost over 150 nations of the world. If he does not have a private jet, tell me how will he be able to go to all those countries? And almost every week, there has to be one nation or the other. So it all depends on level of responsibility that he has. I cannot write a, I have a private jet now because I don't have a need for it because of the level of what I do. So I think we also have to, just like you will see some, some key business people in the world who have so much to do and who have to go to most countries of the world to do the things they do. So I think uh, it's a relative term when we look at it critically. Okay. We have a tweet here from uh, Habiba Abdullahi and uh, she raises some... Um, uh, an issue here it says some parents encourage hatred at a tender age. I remember my friend's mother sending me out of their house because of religious differences. It's so painful. Yeah. Right. That's, that is true. Uh, yes. We have a school somewhere when a five-year-old child was asked to draw his world. He said, I will not throw trash. There will be a lot of candy. But the people of the trash, I will not rubbish trash. i will not throw trash around mm -hmm. it will be clean mm -hmm. but the other people of the other faith will be ugly when they change i will give them candy that's a five-year-old child drawing mm -hmm. and narrating his life so who taught him the mothers and and, the, uh, and sometimes also the teachers we have religious teachers that will attach to our children who sometimes inculcating them the value of uh, hatred. The hatred and uh, exclusivism so we need to redo this thing. Religious leaders must be seen as practicing what they say. He just mentioned that at a very high level, they can sit, take tea, drink, and when they go behind the closet, they tell their followers different things. Yeah. Not for control. And why control? Resources. Mm -hmm. Some people are venomous in their speech because they want to control the minds and not for anything resource. It is said that most conflicts in the world are resource-based. Whether in the church or in the mocks or elsewhere, somebody somewhere, a it's conflict entrepreneur, a, a shadow is pressing the button in order to manipulate people. It is time for religious leaders to expose 
the bad people among them, sir. It is time for religious leaders to begin to talk about the theology of communication, inclusive theology, where we begin to rehumanize the others. If we do that, and we are doing it conspicuously, outside and inside, then it will be clear. And also about litigating hate and dangerous speech, whether it's a politician yeah. mm -hmm. or it's a religious leader, anybody who say anything that tends to demonize and cause violence should be held responsible for those statements. So we should not leave this to religious leaders alone, sir. Okay. It should also go to pastors. We should monitor the messages of pastors on, on, on Sunday. We should monitor the uh, messages of imams on Friday and bring people to account. Anyone found doing that should be, should be tried. Now, where people have failed to use religion to their undue advantage, like we mentioned earlier, they've also used um, ethnic differences. Today, um, what I'm not entitled to, I insist on getting, and if I do not get it, then someone begins to say, maybe it's because I'm a Buraman or I'm a Wagi man or I'm a Yoruba, uh, they, or they'd rather give it to a Hausa man instead. Or, you know, and yeah. it's easy to play up the ethnic sentiments. What can we begin to do to turn this around? Well, the Nigerian constitution has provided for uh, some ways of easing these kind of uh, anomalies, like uh, the Federal Character Commission decree. I'm privileged to have worked as the pioneer director of finance of the Federal Character Commission, and I know uh, we were empowered and this decree, this act has not been repealed. It is still in force that resources of the state, including appointments to various offices, must reflect the federal character of the country. This goes far away to, to include, of course, religions, tribes, regions, and so on. And that is why, for example, Mr. President must appoint a minister <laughs> from each state. <laughs> and uh, there are provisions like this. Right. But the problem still persists. Are we getting the best because, from these provisions? Because of corruption. Uh -huh. right. mm -hmm. People have been impoverished. People have been made poor. We talk about yeah. poverty, not because we were born poor, but because uh, people in authority conspire to make the people poor. We have enough resources yeah. that could go around. We have all the laws that you require. I mean, the, the local laws, not even to talk about the religious laws. The laws, for example, in Islam, I will give you one simple example. Imam, I would have relied on you to, yeah. to talk about this. A verse of the Holy Quran says, and it warns that you should not concentrate wealth in the hands of a few, but spread it out to the poor, the needy, mm -hmm. your kinsmen, mm -hmm. and the society, even the wayfarer, somebody coming to pass by. Mm -hmm. That do not concentrate wealth in the hands of a few people. And of course, obey the prophet, whatever he decides, whatever he detects you, you should do. So the laws are there in the scriptures. The laws are there also uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. Okay. But factors like corruption... And that is why the war against corruption is very, very fundamental. If you eliminate corruption in Nigeria, you would have solved more than 90% of our problems. Okay. Whatever it takes to wipe off corruption, I think we should support this war to make sure that we are back to our feet. Okay. Um, from, from the phones, um, Abuja here, we have uh, Kabir, right? From Abuja. Hello, Kabir. Uh, 
Yes, go ahead, please. Hello? Yes, hello, go on. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? We can yes. hear you. Just go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Well, well, we might just have to carry on because we, we're on, on the last lap of this program now. That's still talking about um, stemming uh, the plane up of ethnic uh, sentiments. Yes, uh, sentiment. That's gone hand in hand with uh, religious sentiments too. Yeah, Bishop. I think um, they go really quite hand in hand and uh, one does not even know which one is higher. The, you know, religious sentiments or the ethnic sentiment. Mm -hmm. And uh, people still whip those ethnic sentiments for their own selfish gain, for the mm -hmm. things they know they can gain and um, use it against the other people. So I think what needs to be done is for us to understand that we are each other's keepers. And like I've always said, whether the person is Hausa or Yoruba or Igbo, is a human being created by God. When God asked Cain, where is Abel your brother? He simply said to God, am I my brother's keeper? And I've always said it, if you are not your brother's keeper, then you must be his killer. Because at the time <laughs> that God was asking Cain, where is Abel your brother? He has already killed him. And then we ask God back, am I my brother's keeper? And then I said, well, if you are not your brother's keeper, you must be his killer. Mm. So we must see each person with that eye that God sees them. No matter what tribe they belong to, no matter where they, they come from, mm. they are your brothers. We are first of all Nigerians before we are Boju or before we are Yoruba or Hausa. We are first of all Nigerians before our tribal sentiment. So we must respect, honor, and love our sensitivity as Nigerians, and we must stand in that and honor each other, no matter what our tribes may be. Uh, and like our pledge play, 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 will say, in, 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 in tongues we differ, but in, uh, in what now we are one. Yeah. So I think we need to understand that so seriously. Right, Iman. I think one of the things I want to add to this is that is a very key important thing, and that is it's still on the issue of identity. Mm. And uh, one thing that stuck my mind is our own project. We have a project called Tolerance. The Tolerance project is about moving beyond tolerance. How do you accept the other for what he is? Mm. And as, as a faith interfaith organizations, this is the cardinal principle within our, our, our project. And what is important in that is that in the Quran, Quran chapter, in the Holy Quran, we have a verse that was very clear when God talked about why did it identity issues? Mm. How does it come about identity? Therefore, it's not where you come from. The essence in this verse is the same. Oh, you mankind, indeed, we created you for male and female. They made you into tribes, color, and nations. This diversity in your color, diversity in your languages which you have in this, is not a yardstick to measure you are the best of all. Mm. The essence is that in your piety, in your consciousness, in your ability to be godlike, to be able to share with the good, the bad, and the ugly in your community. That's what makes you unique. And I feel the missing link is very often most of our religious leaders. Today, they want to be, if they are in the, let me put it in the Nigerian context. If you are in the south-south, you are, no matter how good you are, anybody from the north is seen as mala. South, south, south is our smaller. No matter how pastor his pastor, as long as he dressed Ari Wawe, he's a mala. Vice versa, anybody who comes from the, the other side, they don't they see he's a Christian. They don't even think there's a Muslim who is indigenous of the south southern part of this country. This vice versa. Mm. Secondly, the issue of indigenous settler syndrome. Mm. This thing, I believe this present government should do away, find a way to make us Nigerian first and foremost Citizens before anything else. Nigeria. As a citizen of Nigeria, yeah. can we eradicate indigenous and settler in wherever it is in the constitution? Let's remove it. Hey, Number I, two, sir, okay. on that, right. I want to say that religious leaders, we should stop patronizing this Haji and Jerusalem seat. We don't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. You just should stop politicians using public money to pay Haji seat and give you special seat, free seat for Haji. Give you seat for Jerusalem. Want to go to Mecca and to to on Jeru to Israel. Give you free seat. This thing was stopped. Mm -hmm. Number three, they should stop giving us ram for Salah. They should stop giving us goat for Christmas. This thing was stopped. 
stop using public money. Na cow with chop. Uh, na cow. <laughs> Made them stop, stop giving us these cows. Because these are the way, until we as religious leaders, on our Mumbai, mm. on our Hutuba, on our sermon on Fridays and Sundays, we start saying, most a politician, I don't want that. Mm. I don't, stop coming and give us seat. If anybody wants to go to Mecca, let him work hard, earn his money, and go mm -hmm. for Mecca. Yeah, if you want to go to Jerusalem. Including some civil servants. It's not only politicians. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. high-level civil servants are also in this game. Mm. I want to say right. clearly, sir, right. we must use our... That is a book we wrote, The Pastor and Imam Responding to Conflict. It brings this diversity, and yet say... We have some differences. Let's massage those differences and accept them. Where we have yes. common grounds, let's use our common grounds to unite this nation. A way out of these ethnic things. I'm glad that the present government is going into agri. Some years back, there is a soil map of Nigeria that depicts every soil type. They have thrown it away because oil came. Let's go back to those maps. They were drawn. They were made in Nigeria by Nigerians. Soil option map. And let young people take portions of land. I'm assuring you within one or two years, if we take these teeming young guys to the, the farm and really motivate them, Nigeria will have a, a turnaround. We must learn to respond and remove poverty mentality. Where enough is not enough. We always are accumulating for our great-great-grandchildren. And yet... We are one day so a, a leader said they will be driving in their cars. Our children that we have so much accumulated money and bought cars for them, they may not pass to in certain streets because the children of the poor will stop them. And this is the danger that we are passing through now. <laughs> All right, sales. You see, uh, yeah. I, I want to be uh, very realistic about these differences. Mm. They start right from the scratch, from the primary school, from the secondary school, from infancy. Mm -hmm. Like somebody has called or tweeted that she went into a house and she was driven away, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally had an experience like that in the, in the 70s when we were in the University of Zaria. A religious man refused to shake hands with me because I was not wearing this kind of dress, mm. but I was wearing a shirt uh, without a cap. Mm -hmm. A fellow Muslim like me refused to shake hands with me because I, he, according to him, <laughs> you know, the gospel according to him, mm -hmm. he has invented his own <laughs> and was calling others to do. Mm -hmm. Now, this is from within a religious group. We have the ethnic conflicts not necessarily between Hausa or settlers or non-settlers, even among the settlers themselves. Yeah. I'll give an example of Kaduna State. We had the Baju Ikulu crisis. Kamuru Tasha Daji, Aki Bishop. You remember mm -hmm. this yeah. very protracted and well. a very terrible <laughs> kind of conflict mm -hmm. that was from, uh, you know, between a people who were within the same geographical uh, area, the like location, sisters, they yeah. are supposed to be brothers and sisters, but simply because somebody was manipulating this side, another was manipulating the other side, they are in conflict. Look at the Ife Modakeki crisis. Right. This is something that has done so much damage among the Yorubas. You, you know, it, so they were not coming across to the north to be segregated upon or to be fought on, mm. but they were fighting themselves. Mm. So, the 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 but the the fundamental point is that uh, there are lots of misunderstandings, there are lots of misguidance, mm. and there was there is so much manipulation mm. going on due to our corrupt tendencies. Mm. We need to do a reorientation, and uh, it is a difficult job to do. We have to reorient our society to do away with this. But it is possible, and it is, it is happening now. The trials of corrupt persons mm. are supposed to be big lessons for others to, you know, to, to come back to their senses mm. and know that Nigeria of yesterday, is, is Nigeria of today is it's not the Nigeria of yesterday. yesterday. 
and uh, we have to do away with those problems in order to move forward. Mm. Okay. And this is a situation mm. for which we need the support of each and every one of us. Mm. Then we can live in peace and harmony uh, as groups, as individuals, and even as families. Right. Mutual respect. For, for one another. other. Yes. For one another. For one another. I must respect my brother, the Imam, despite the fact that he is in and religion. And I'm in religion. Mm -hmm. Respect my brother in respect of the fact that he is a Muslim and I'm a Christian. There must be mutual respect. There must be respect for one another. Sometimes even within the same faith, you do oh, yeah. have that even happening where you of course. Know, well, exactly. I mean, different yeah. sects and uh, That's it. You, you have the conflicts going on, uh, you know, yes. Pentecostals yes. And, and what the, they call the Orthodox, the Orthodox churches. churches. Within, within Islam, you have the different sects also yeah. and each one claiming, no, I am the one practicing the true one. And uh, it's something yeah. is happening. Yeah, mutual respect, mutual love and understanding. In all things, there must be that understanding. There must be that respect. The Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another, no barrier. You must express that love. It was love that took Jesus to the cross. We just finished from Easter. It was love. And you don't love the perfect man. You love everybody. It, somebody doesn't have to be perfect before you love him. No. You love, because and that's what the love does. It covers a multitude of wrong. If I love my brother, I would not want to kill him. I would not want to do anything to hurt him. So there has to be that love, that understanding, that mutual respect. And even the leadership from, from government cycles, there has to be that mutual respect for all religions, for all faiths. That mutual respect for all uh, in the leadership. And that We'll be able to move on together I think we as need, one. We need forgiveness too. Nigerians yeah. should forgive one another. I think yeah. we should draw a line from this day onward. We will not like to live by the on the past. The issues of the unhealed memories, yeah. collective unhealed memories of the past, should be forgiven. He say forgive. Yeah. If not, you don't forgive. You'll never be forgiven. Forgive. So for this, I want to call uh, a, do a clarion call. There should be a sincere north south dialogue. Let the young people begin to come together and discuss the issues of this nation, guided by religious leaders. Every Friday, we have a, a, a religious general assembly where the preacher stays there and preach to thousands. Let's begin to communicate inclusive theology. Number two, every Sunday, pastors meet wherever they stay. Let them begin to teach inclusive. We will be held responsible for every idle word. If today I preach and my people go to hate and there is no dialogue, it's no sincere dialogue, and I make people hate the other, I will be held responsible. I, my father fought the Biafran war. I know the pains of the Biafran war. I came as a young child. I was manipulated and I was made to hate the others. And I would say, what will Jesus do if he were here in person? And I think every young man there should ask himself, what will Christ do? And if he's a Muslim, what does the teaching of Islam say about the coexistence that we have? Then we must live pragmatic Christian life, infectious love, and let's do one competition in this country. Let the Muslim compete to outwit Christians in doing good. Let the Christian <laughs> compete in trying to outwit the Muslim. So when we have double goods, mm -hmm. they will have excellent. Yeah. All right. I think what <laughs> happened is that I think there's a high level of suspicion. Yes. That's so right. how do you do have, away with yes, that suspicion? We have to because do away uh, with suspicion. Mm. Of, we mm. suspect each other. We, you know, we don't we don't trust one another. Mm. When a Muslim cler cleric is telling me something, I say, am I sure he doesn't have another thing in mind? <laughs> when a Christian, even among the Christians, we suspect one another. We have to have that trust. That if I have a president in this country that is a Muslim, I must know that he's sincere in his actions and he does, he's not taking sides in anything and I must respect him, honor him and pray for him. If we have a Christian leader, that respect must also go to him from both faiths. So I think we highly suspect each other. And maybe because of the things that have happened before, we don't really trust one another. Hmm. Well, since you see, it is, a, uh, it is a big problem to live together hmm. and a very easy one also to live together. Okay. Many nations of the world have gone through so many uh, so different crises 
resulting from differences in uh, ethnicity or differences in geographical uh, uh, re, uh, boundaries. Uh, boundaries. For example, in the UK, look at the, the island people. Mm -hmm. The bombings we had here uh, in Nigeria, we were hearing about them from Northern Ireland, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and those in days, those days, those mm -hmm. days and threats, and they were able to, to, to agree among themselves, mm -hmm. resolve those differences. Now they live in peace. Of course, uh, there are other acts of insurgency mm -hmm. coming from somewhere, but that does not mean the problems were not solved. These okay. are new problems. Mm -hmm. so, so we should unite ourselves to solve the problems, our own problems, which we created by ourselves. In if other words, do you that, do not subscribe to a breakup. We mm. cannot break up. <laughs> we do not have to break up. <laughs> to and Nigeria yeah. needs... <laughs> because if you, if you break up or disintegrate... The, the bigger the more, the, 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 more the problems uh, yeah. for yourself. And uh, even within your own house, if you don't integrate, yeah. uh, South Sudan, Sudan, uh, Sudan, yes. Sudan one, Morocco, one important they now they are still fighting. Uh -huh. Now they are fighting. For my, for my experience to what we are talking about, yes. Nigeria, we have come as a nation and we have to continue as a nation. Yeah. We, myself and him, we've, we've been to various hotspots. We are in, in, in Iraq, sharing experience. We are in Bosnia, Herzegovina, in Croatia, in Kosovo, sharing experience about what does it take to live together. We saw them disperse. Mm -hmm. We are in Somalia. We are in the Sudan, both the two Sudan. We work with them to help them see how they can move to the next level. Mm -hmm. And that is captured very assertively in what we call an African answer, which had to look at the northern part of Kenya when they disintegrate. So Nigerians, the core is can we forgive one another? Yeah. Look at from your home. Because most of this brewing idea, it comes because of that unforgiveness yeah. because of that pains of the past at the family level how have i forgive my wife how have i forgive my children how have my children be able to forgive me secondly at our community level how much are we going to forgive those who have caused us pains then at our own town hall town level how yeah. much are we forgiving at the state level the north and the south or the west and the eastern part of your state People on the high land, on the low land, how much have we been able to forgive yourself? <laughs> then at the national level, yeah. can we have a day of forgiveness? Mm -hmm. yeah. A day of, of forgiveness. Of course, in, for in, in Kenya, they declare a sorry day. In Australia, they declare what we call a day of apology, where both the political leaders have to make an apology to the First Nation, the indigenous people. Can we have a day in this nation? Where a day that is a day of forgiveness, mm -hmm. or a day of sorry, or a day of apology, day that of we forgive, we yeah. apologize to one another, so that this small thing called Biafra will not end. Mm -hmm. This small thing called Midubet will no more exist. This small thing called Yoruba, not Yoruba South, will come to an end. Mm -hmm. So that we have a Nigeria that under God mm -hmm. will be proud that we have a nation, and God will be happy Sir, with us. He spoke something quite critical that mm -hmm. I want to comment briefly, right. is mm -hmm. that under the Christian Association of Nigeria, there are churches, intra-religious conflicts. Yeah. Even there is a denomination in this country that the leaders have split into two. They don't see each other. Churches are divided. One side is looking to the south. The other is looking to the south, to the north. I know as a member of executive, you try to intervene. It is a shame on such a denomination that they are fighting for position. And then they are not fighting because of the congregation. They are not fighting because they want to get souls. Mm. They are fighting, fighting because they want sides. money into mm. their pocket. This is the end time thing that intra-religious rancor has to be addressed. We need to do internal cleaning within our faiths before we do the inter-religious dialogue for mm. peace. Mm. Well, at the essence of the forgiveness that he spoke about is a part of the, uh, the tenets of, of, of Christianity. Yeah, that is it. Jesus speaking, he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So if we don't forgive others, God will not forgive us. Mm -hmm. As we ask God to forgive us, we must also release people from our hearts and forgive them so that God also can forgive us. Uh, right. you see, for me, I, uh, when you talk about forgiveness, you 
sometimes you, you give room for mistakes <laughs> for the offense or for the offense to happen <laughs> okay and uh, when you have a national day for forgiveness okay i can do everything and wait until uh, september okay. 1st national day for <laughs> forgiveness then i'll be forgiven <laughs> well, <laughs> yes i don't uh, think that would bother that should not be well that shouldn't be criminality yes. Yes. okay yes. anyhow we would explore that at some other point but yes. uh, for this program we have to leave it there mm. and i'd like to say uh, a big thank you to all our guests tonight and uh, we like to appreciate your spending time and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, Archbishop John Praise Daniel, we thank you for thank coming you. up. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bashir Isiaku, we thank you also for your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Dr. James Movel, we thank you very much. Peace is divine. Practice it. All right. Yeah. And uh, Imam Dr. Muhammad Nurain Ashafa, we thank you very much. Islam is life saving machines. Hmm. You cannot be true as long as your neighbor is not comfortable with you. All right. And so we have to leave it here on this program. We thank you all who uh, participated in this program through your calls, your tweets. We say next week we'll reach you again on NTA Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stover. Bye for now. <laughs>